Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Pharmacology 22. On behalf of the British Pharmacological Society, it's my pleasure to welcome you all. Um, Clive Page, our president, isn't with us yet, but he will be here later today. Uh, so I'm Mark Caulfield, president-elect, and it's my pleasure to open Pharmacology 22. Last week, with the sad news about Her Majesty the Queen, we considered what we should do, and we came to the conclusion that after three years of not holding such a meeting, we should gather together and then therefore we could discuss um, how we felt about that, but also have the usual discursive uh, side meetings around pharmacology and its advancement. So thank you all for coming to Liverpool. So I'm pleased that we're all together for the next two days to celebrate our passion for pharmacology. And what a brilliant place to start with my colleague and friend here, Professor Simonir Paramahamad, who needs ne no introduction whatsoever to this audience, uh, but has had a luminary career in uh, pharmacogenetics and clinical pharmacology, and um, is busy trying to champion its adoption in the National Health Service at the moment, um, and also leading a consortium uh, working with the MHRA and NIHR to look at um, vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia as a side effect of some of the vaccines we've been using recently. Before we begin our first session, I'm going to just remind you of some usual rather boring housekeeping, but nonetheless um, important. If there's a fire alarm, it's real. Uh, there's no drills planned, and then just follow the exits. Um, I'd like to thank all our sponsors, and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the British Pharmacological Society staff, and if you get a chance over the next two days, please do thank them. They put enormous effort into making this possible. So I hope you have a fabulous two days. And I'll now invite uh, Munir to give his lecture, uh, Individual Variability in Drug Response, Looking Forward. Munir. So, thank you very much, Mark, and uh, welcome to Liverpool. Uh, it's so good to see uh, so many friends and colleagues in the room. When I was president, uh, till the end of last year, uh, we only had one meeting in person, and this is the first annual pharmacology meeting for about three years, so it's great to see everybody. Um, so I want to talk to you about inter-individual variability now as a group of uh, pharmacologists, clinical pharmacologists in the room. Uh, you may say, well, we all know all about this, but hopefully at the end of this, I can convince you that we don't actually take into account inter-individual variability in what we do. And the one word I want to leave you with by the end of the talk is inclusivity in terms of the trials we undertake. So if you look at the UK medicines landscape, the figures, some of the figures and the um, metrics are absolutely astonishing. We give 1.1 billion community prescriptions per year, a cost which is increasing all the time, uh, but the harms also associated with that and the wastage uh, is enormous uh, with the medicines landscape uh, in this country. And this was clearly shown uh, in Keith Ridge's overprescribing report, uh, which was published at the end of last year. And he basically said that 10% of prescriptions should not have been issued, which is a huge number, about 110 million. Uh, also in there were data on the degree of polypharmacy in our patients, and that's been increasing uh, over the years. And, and that affects particularly the elderly, who are not included often in clinical trials, those with disabilities, and those with minority ethnic backgrounds. Now, we have known about variability for a long time. William Osler uh, basically talked about variability in relation to disease. But that variability uh, in disease also affects the variability in the way we respond to drugs. It's exactly the same process. And we're beginning to learn more about it, but we don't really do very much about it in terms of how we treat patients. And the problem is that that leads to pro uh, problems in terms of drug response, in terms of efficacy and safety. So if you look at efficacy, uh, almost every drug that we have in the British National Formulary has variable efficacy for, for whatever reason. It may be disease related, it may be related to that individual uh, factors as well. And Alan Roses, who was GSK Vice President, once said that 90% of drugs only work in 30 to 50% of patients. Safety is a big issue. 6.5% of all 
admissions to our hospitals are due to adverse drug reactions. This was a paper published in 2004 by ourselves in the British Medical Journal. Um, more recently, we published another one, which says that when you're particularly looking at a multi-morbid population, uh, the re uh, 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 frequency is about 16% of admissions to our hospitals are due to adverse drug reactions. Now, there are many factors that determine uh, inter-individual variability, and some of those are shown on the slide. I don't have time to go through all of these, uh, but as you imagine, I am going to focus a bit later on on pharmacogenomics, but I want to take into account some of the uh, two other factors, first of all, and give you uh, uh, what is happening at the moment in terms of um, the evidence base, but also in terms of what's in the uh, summary of product characteristics. So the first one I'm going to take into account is sex, uh, and then secondly, weight. So if you look at trials, females are underrepresented uh, in preclinical studies as well as in clinical trials. And for most drugs, there's no sex stratified dosing. L the literature suggests, despite confounding factors, that women are at 1.5 to 1.7 fold greater risk of adverse drug reactions. And clearly part of this may be due to the different diseases uh, that occur in women compared to men. However, we know, all of us know, that there are important pharmacological differences between men and women. Uh, women have a lower lean body mass and therefore volume of distribution. Uh, there's reduced hepatic and renal clearance. Um, if you look at, because of the hormonal environment, there's an increase in cytochrome P453A4 activity in the liver. And there are also pharmacodynamic differences. Um, and part of the reason for the increase uh, in ADR rates is, is actually the pharmacokinetic differences. And when people have looked at that, there's a remarkable correlation between the differences between pharmacokinetics and ADRs. The graph here uh, shows that uh, in some cases the pharmacokinetic differences are greater in w women uh, than in men, but there are some drugs where you have differences in men greater than women um, and that uh, correlation with the ADRs. Uh, and here's an example of the confusion that occurs then in terms of what prescribers can do. So if you look at Zolpidem, in 2013, the FDA uh, uh, put out a warning that there was a risk of next morning impairment, uh, which was higher in women than in men. This was ascribed to reduce elimination, about 35% lower clearance. When you look at the approval of Zolpidem, PK studies which were done at the beginning um, basically uh, in 1992, only had 19 women and 49 men at that time. So the FDA asked for the dose to be reduced from 10 milligrams to 5 milligrams in women. However, this was not followed by any other regulatory agency changing that uh, advice. And the FDA has been criticized in scientific literature. Goldblatt et al. said that there wasn't enough evidence actually to be able to make that change. But actually they showed this is the graph is from their particular uh, paper, um, and they showed there were differences in uh, PK, um, and then they said, well, there was no differences in driving ability, etc. but those studies were all small, and what we're looking at is small differences which may not be picked up in routine kind of clinical studies we undertake, and therefore uh, we ignore them at the moment, and clearly what we need to think about as we move forward is inclusivity to make sure women are adequately represented in trials, and we actually then look at effects of sex on efficacy as well as safety rates as we move forward. Let me take uh, weight uh, as the next example. Uh, if you look at the rate of obesity in England, these are data from there, but actually in almost every country, uh, particularly in the Western world, uh, the rates of obesity are increasing, um, and the numbers of people who are morbidly obese are increasing. Um, and we don't really dose them appropriately uh, in clinical practice at the moment. So if you look at obesity and drug dosing, again, obese patients are underrepresented or excluded uh, in clinical trials. And for most drugs, we use a fixed uh, dosing strategy, a one-dose-fits-all strategy. Uh, and even when weight-based dosing is used, for example, for enoxaparin, there's often a cap at about 100 milligrams, 100 kilograms, um, and, and uh, so the morbidly obese are often undertreated. We know that as lean body weight increases, 
there's an increase in clearance, and that's important for the maintenance dose, and volume distribution depends on the hydrophilicity, lipophilicity of the drug, etc., uh, and therefore depends on the total amount of uh, fat mass, that's uh, adipose weight that's present in an individual. And if you look at uh, individuals who've got normal weight and look at the ratio between adipose weight and lean weight, and then you compare that with the obese individual, that ratio changes, and therefore uh, the volume of distribution, uh, clearance, etc., will all change, and therefore, but at the moment, we just don't take that into account in the way we dose. Now, there are difficulties in how do you calculate the drug dose in obese individuals, the various parameters people have suggested, the total body weight to use, or the lean body weight, and the total body weight is what we use at the moment, or about the adjusted body weight, or the body surface area as is used in, for chemotherapy, or ideal body weight, which has been used for insurance purposes, not for really pharmacological purposes. And when you start uh, calculating, what does that mean in terms of a particular individual? So if you look at a 150 kilogram man who's 170 centimeters tall with very high BMI, um, the total body weight is 150 kilograms, but the lean body weight is 80 kilograms, whereas ideal body weight is 65 kilograms. So which one do you use? And that confusion there um, is, makes, um, means that we actually just use uh, total body weight uh, or not at all, and we just dose everybody in the same way. And clearly, again, inclusivity and understanding how uh, we can develop drugs in the future, also work on drugs that are out there at the moment, and develop better dosing, particularly in the uh, uh, obese individuals who are at risk of the largest number of diseases, uh, but we actually don't treat them well, and part of the sort of outcomes uh, in people with obesity is because they probably aren't being treated properly. So let me just move on to genomics and pharmacogenomics as a source of variability. Now, all of you will know that this is not uh, an old, uh, uh, this is not a new area. Uh, it's been around for a long time, perhaps since the time of Pythagoras. But pharmacogenetics was a, a term which was coined by Friedrich Vogel, who was on the slide, a German pharmacologist. And then in 1997, Marshall, who was the editor of Nature Biotechnology, still the editor of Nature Biotechnology, coined the term pharmacogenomics. Now that we have, we can actually look at the whole genome. Uh, most people use the term pharmacogenomics, but both terms are used interchangeably. And it is really the study of variation in the DNA and RNA and how it relates to drug response. And the numbers of papers and the number interest in pharmacogenomics has increased exponentially, as you can see on the graph, since the completion of the Human Genome Project. Now, you may say, well, is it important for us? Well, actually, if you look at the world population, if you look at all the different studies which have been undertaken in terms of pharmacogenomic variation, uh, irrespective of which continent you look at, pharmacogenomic variation is extremely common. Uh, it's over 95% in most populations. So all of you here will have at least one pharmacogenomic variant. And I know that Mark has looked at the 100,000 Genomes Project where he uh, led the 100,000 Genomes Project. And again, the rate of pharmacogenomic variation is about 99% in the 100,000 Genomes Project as well. So very common, uh, but we don't really take into account the variation. Now, you may say, well, actually, it may be pharmacogenomic variation is common, but what about pharmacogenomic drugs? And this is work from Emma Baker, uh, where she looked at CPRD, and she looked at the list of drugs there, which in farm GKB pharmacogenetics knowledge base, where there is some uh, dosing or, or guidance, um, and then looked at how often people are prescribed at least one of those drugs. And in one year, 58% of patients are prescribed at least one of those drugs, where there's a guidance, pharmacogenomic guidance, could be used for choice or dose of the drug. And this increases as we age. So by the time uh, we are over about the age of 70, about 89% will be prescribed at least one pharmacogenomic drug over a 20-year period. So pharmacogenomic variation is common. We are commonly exposed to drugs where there's good data in terms of pharmacogenomic variation. Now, if you look at um, identification of pharmacogenomic variation, that has obviously changed. In the 1960s, uh, Bob Smith did work on debrisoquine, and you had to give uh, a single dose of the drug uh, and then collect urine uh, uh, for six hours and then be able to measure the metabolite to parent drug ratio and from that determine whether a patient was a poor metabolizer or an extensive metabolizer. Clearly, those were uh, very laborious studies um, and, and meant that really very small numbers were tested. Clearly, in the 1990s, we started getting PCR-based analysis of 
individual variants and then multiple variants. And then in 2000s, about 2007, genome-wide association studies came out. Um, and then uh, exome sequencing, whole genome sequencing. So we have the tools now uh, to really look at the pharmacogenomic variation. And that is also uh, providing us with uh, additional information in terms of mechanisms of actions or mechanisms of adverse drug reactions. So here's something that we uh, published at the end of last year. Um, and this was looking at aspirin-induced peptic ulceration, which is one of the commonest adverse drug reactions which leads to hospital admission uh, in, our, in, in many countries. And this was 75 milligrams of aspirin, and we recruited people who had peptic ulceration based on uh, endoscopy criteria. Um, and we recruited over 600 people uh, to be able to look at that, and then we compared controls who had been exposed to aspirin uh, plus population-based controls. And what we found was that there was a, a signal in chromosome 8. Um, and when you do zoom plot, as you can see on the slide, that, is, uh, that particular SNP is located within a gene called EYA1. EYA1 stands for eyes absent one. Now, this has uh, been implicated in some Mendelian disease called brachioautorenal syndrome, where uh, kids have renal dystrophy um, and also ear abnormalities and limb abnormalities. But nobody would have guessed that aspirin can actually interact with this particular gene um, and lead to peptic ulceration. And there's some functional work that's going on to be able to look at the exact mechanisms of how that occurs. So the genomic studies are also uh, making us understand potential mechanisms of toxicity, but also potential mechanisms of efficacy. So I'm just going to give you two exemplars before talking about the report we published uh, with the British Pharmacological Society earlier this year. First is clopidogrel efficacy, and the second is carbamazepine hypersensitivity. So clopidogrel is a very widely used drug as an antithrombotic, uh, used in uh, people with ischemic heart disease as well as cerebrovascular disease. Uh, clopidogrel is a prodrug. It's absorbed. AB um, p glycoproteins involves absorption. It's metabolized by esterases in peripheral blood uh, to inactive metabolites. But it's also metabolized particularly by cytochrome P452C19 in the liver to form the active metabolite, which then binds to the P2Y12 receptor um, and therefore leads to platelet um, uh, lack of uh, increases, plate, uh, um, inhibits platelet aggregation. And work which has been undertaken over the years, and this is work which was undertaken in the United States looking at stent thrombosis, was able to show that individuals who are carriers of the polymorphism had a worse outcome in terms of strength thrombosis rates uh, compared to those who were uh, uh, wild type, basically highlighting that clopidogrel was not being activated in those individuals. And this has also been shown uh, in cerebral vascular disease and uh, what this paper, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine last year, looked at was people who had loss of function car uh, uh, carriers uh, for 2C19, um, and those, they had had stroke or TIAs. As you can see, it was a large trial, randomized control trial, in over 5,000 individuals. And if uh, uh, the, uh, what these investigators did was to randomize people to clopidogrel aspirin or to cragogrel and aspirin, and what they found was that the outcomes which is the sort of uh, cumulative incident stroke, was greater in those which were randomized to clopidogrel and aspirin, uh, about a 23% uh, uh, increase uh, risk uh, in those individuals, highlighting that potentially in those individuals we, may should, we should be using different drugs uh, compared to just clopidogrel. And this may be particularly relevant uh, in different parts of the world. Um, and again, inclusivity is important. A lot of genomics lacks diversity. The majority of genome-wide association studies have been done, 97% have been uh, in European populations. Uh, very few have been done, for example. 0.7% have been done in African populations. But if you look at the world prevalence of cytochrome P452C19 poly polymorphisms, you find that the rates uh, of the um, variant polymorphism is much higher uh, in Asia, as you can see on the two graphs there, highlighting that because the frequency of polymorphism is much higher there, uh, it may be particularly important to be able to really uh, utilize data to individualize drug therapy, for example, with drugs such as clopidogrel, but there are also other CYP2C19 substrates on the uh, slide there. Now, if we move on to carbamazepine, an area we've been interested in particularly is the human leukocyte antigen. Uh, uh, antigens, which are on the major histocompatibility complex on chromosome 6, short-term chromosome 6. 
uh, it has more than 200 genes, are uh, involved in more than 100 diseases, but they're also involved in uh, the pathogenesis of immune-mediated adverse drug reactions. And carbamazepine is a very widely used drug in epilepsy, trigeminal neuralgia, bipolar disorder. It causes hypersensitivity reactions which are characterized by skin, uh, um, uh, uh, macular exanthema, but also uh, more severe uh, blistering reactions such as Stephen Johnson syndrome. It can also cause hepatic failure and uh, DRESS as well, which is drug reaction with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms. Uh, carbamazepine is extremely complex in terms of its metabolism with over 30 pathways, 30 metabolites having been identified. And if somebody's had carbamazepine hypersensitivity, and this is work undertaken in Dee's Nesbitt's lab in Liverpool, uh, is that if you take their uh, peripheral blood molecular cells, uh, incubate them with uh, carbamazepine, you get T-cell proliferation, as you can see uh, in the, uh, uh, in, on the slide. And work which was undertaken by Vincent Diep uh, in uh, the department was able to show uh, that carbamazepine is bioactivated to epoxide metabolites, which bind preferentially to histidine 146 at, uh, on the on HSA, um, and this can be shown by mass spectrometry. And that new antigen that's formed from there may be partly responsible for the immune reaction which occurs, and therefore the serious uh, um, outcomes which can occur in those individuals. Now, work which has been undertaken all over the world, and this was uh, work that uh, um, Anna Alfa which was in the audience, led, uh, was able to show that uh, the, the uh, association with this particular HLA allele, B star 1502, is, is huge in terms of its odds ratios, about 113. This has been shown initially in uh, Taiwan, but then replicated in very many Han Chinese populations, in Thai populations, and in Malaysian populations, with an odds ratio of 113, almost like a Mendelian disease uh, for this particular uh, HLA allele. And in fact, colleagues from Taiwan that we know very well and we worked with were able to undertake a prospective study where they, followed, uh, they uh, recruited 4,877 carbamazepine naive individuals, genotyped them for HLA B1502. When they were positive, which was 7.7%, they were given a completely different drug, not given carbamazepine, others were given carbamazepine. When they followed up these individuals for three months, none of them developed Stephen Johnson syndrome toxic necrolysis. Uh, when you look at when they compare that to historical controls, they would expect about five cases of Stephen Johnson syndrome toxic epidemic necrolysis, um, and they were felt that this showed that it actually improved uh, outcomes in those patients when you do use genotype guided strategy. And since then, um, the SPC, summary product characteristics, has been changed in the United States, in European and Southeast Asian uh, uh, drug labels. Um, and it basically says that uh, you should do HLA B1502 typing uh, in patients of Southeast Asian origin. Um, now, again, that creates some complexity. How, are you, how can you be sure somebody's of Southeast Asian origin? Um, and that creates complexity at this of, uh, in the clinic uh, when people are trying to understand who they should test and who they shouldn't test. But uh, where it has been used, uh, and this has been shown in Taiwan, in Singapore, uh, in um, in uh, uh, Thailand as well, uh, that uh, genotyping has reduced the incidence of SGSTEN. Um, so that is important to show that actually genomics can make a difference. In the UK and in European populations, uh, HLA-B1502 is virtually absent. It's, it's got a population frequency of 0.001%. But uh, we were able to do some studies in 22 patients with hypersensitivity syndrome. Uh, which showed a very strong association with HLA A star 3101, a different HLA allele. This has now been replicated in Japanese, Chinese, South Koreans, Canadians, and other EU populations. The number needed to test to prevent one case of hypersensitivity is only 47, and we also worked with different hues to be able to show that this is a cost-effective thing to be able to do to genotype people before they put them on carbamazepine. And again, um, in Japan, they did a prospective study similar to the Taiwanese study I showed for a carb maze being in 1502 before. Uh, they did this in 36 hospitals in about 1,200 patients. Um, and they typed people for HLA A30 101, and 17.5% were positive. They were not given carb maze uh, and they were given other drugs. And what they found was that 23 patients 
<clears throat> had cutaneous adverse drug reactions, three patients at rest, no patients at SGSTN, where they compared with the historical controls, genotyping reduced the incidence of cutaneous ADRs by 40 to 60 percent, highlighting that this, they felt that this was warranted in clinical practice. There are now guidelines which have been produced, which suggest that uh, every patient who goes on carbamazepine should be genotyped for 1502 and 3101 at the same time, and uh, what uh, pay, this drug should be avoided unless individual clinical benefit risk uh, is positive for that particular individual, i.e. that they need carbamazepine. So there is increasing amounts of evidence out there which shows that uh, pharmacogenomic variation is important in determining uh, outcomes for patients in terms of both efficacy and safety. Uh, and we worked uh, during the pandemic, we worked with the Royal College of Physicians which represents 26 different medical specialties uh, and uh, set up a working group. And we worked online uh, for over 12 months to really uh, develop a report which highlighted the importance of implementing pharmacogenomics uh, in the NHS. This was published earlier this year and it's been very well received, not only uh, by the pharmacological community, but also by the medical community as well. And the outcomes uh, and the recommendations from this report are shown on the slide here. The first thing was that we said that clinical implementation should occur in both primary and secondary care settings as well as in specialized centers. And this may be an iterative process. You may need to start with a small number of gene drug pairs, but actually increase to the uh, number that are uh, present at the moment in terms of literature, good literature evidence of clinical utility. We also said that it was important that this was centrally funded uh, so that uh, there wasn't any kind of postcode uh, pharmacogenomics, a uh, postcode lottery in terms of pharmacogenomics implementation. And this can be funded through the NHS National Genomic Test Directory, which is very well established. Clearly, pharmacogenomics is improving all the time in terms of new variants being identified, et cetera, and new evidence coming through. So these services will need to be agile and able to work at pace to be able to impl implement new findings as they come through. Um, and that's going to be important, uh, is important for all areas of medicine, but we often do not uh, implement new things into clinical practice very quickly. One of the biggest issues with implementing pharmacogenomics is the huge gap, knowledge gap, uh, in our healthcare workforce. And so the implementation of pharmacogenomics should be uh, accompanied by comprehensive education and training package. Um, clinicians will need support. Um, I, in my clinic, I have about 15 minutes to see a patient. A general practitioner has about eight minutes to see a patient. And if you give them a long list of uh, genomics data, um, they, it's going to take them much longer and they're not going to ignore it. So therefore, we need clinical decision support systems which allow us to really uh, um, make sure that the right uh, information is given to the individual, to the doctor, and the right, it's interpreted correctly, and the right outcome occurs, as a right action occurs as a result of that information. Now, the problem with, and many of you will say, well, actually, we need randomized control trials for pharmacogenomics implementation. Now, there are so many pharmacogenomic variants, there's no way we can carry out randomized control trials for all of those particular pharmacogenomic variants. And there will be some areas where we do need to undertake uh, randomized control trials. But some of those will have to be based on observational studies. And therefore, it's really important that we follow uh, any implementation through uh, in terms of looking at uh, outcomes in patients. And we can do that using the data infrastructure that we have in this country so that we can have a continuous iterative evaluation. And if things are not working, we can go around the loop in a learning health system to be able to improve that, uh, improve the services for patients. Clearly, there should be more funding, et cetera, in this area for further work and pharmacogenomics implementation should be accompanied by clear lines of communication, particularly uh, with the patients and public. Uh, they need to know what the benefits are, but they also need to know what the limitations are of pharmacogenomics. Now, I think that pharmacogenomics is an opportunity for clinical pharmacologists who work in the NHS, uh, we, uh, and not only in uh, secondary care, but also in primary care. And I think the pharmacolo clinical pharmacology needs to start working at the interface between primary and secondary care. Um, and so I think 
having that knowledge is going to be important for clinical pharmacology in terms of helping with implementation and clinical pharmacologists could be part of multidisciplinary teams uh, to be able to really make sure the implementation works correctly uh, in uh, the NHS uh, when the NHS implements this. It's already done that for certain areas, such as, for example, dihydropyrimidine dehydrogenase for 5-FU uh, uh, chemotherapy in uh, colon cancer and breast cancer. Um, and, and we published an editorial associated with that uh, particular report, again, highlighting the relevance and opportunities for clinical pharmacology in many different areas shown on the slide uh, there. Now, people may say, well, actually, um, I'm still not convinced about the evidence for pharmacogenomics evaluation. And what we said, one of the things was that we said that one should actually do a panel-based approach. That is, if somebody comes to you, you uh, for a particular drug prescription, you uh, send the, the DNA for testing, they will be tested for that particular variant you're interested in, but they will also be tested for a large number of variants, which could then be stored in the electronic health record, so that as they become, uh, get older and they need more drugs, that data is already available on the electronic health record. So we're moving from a reactive to a preemptive strategy. A panel-based pharmacogenomic testing is what we recommended. Now, you may say, what is the evidence for that? Well, I'm just going to show you some unpublished data from work that uh, we've been involved in. Uh, in Liverpool, in a European consortium called, uh, as part of the Ubiquitous Pharmacogenomics Consortium. And this is data, which is unpublished, and Henke and Gukela, who is uh, the PI for this particular consortium, coordinator for this consortium, uh, uh, passed these slides on to me. So what we did in this was to undertake a cluster design uh, trial, um, and this was called PREPARE. Uh, whereby individuals were either started off on usual care, which is no pharmacogenomic testing, or pharmacogenomics guided prescribing. Halfway through, we swapped over the different hospitals. This was undertaken in seven different centers uh, throughout the EU, um, and each center had the same uh, genotyping platform, had the same guidance, um, and uh, operated the same protocol. Um, Liverpool was the only UK center to be able to do this. And this is the patient journey study arm. It was an extremely complicated study, and uh, many of my team who are on in the uh, room uh, were involved in this, despite the fact that we didn't actually get enough funding to be able to do this. But we felt it was important that we actually got everybody involved in this so that we can actually undertake the study. Uh, patient, having been identified um, as part of the trial, were, had a DNA sample taken. Uh, this was put into the EMR if they were in the case arm, um, and then uh, the clinician was told about the variant. Then the clinician had to decide whether they want to take into account the fact that the patient had a pharmacogenomic variance. It wasn't mandatory, uh, and the clinicians were told, given the evidence as to why that uh, uh, choice of drug or dose should be undertaken in that individual with a pharmacogenomic variation. We then followed up the patients, as you can see, for three months uh, in different ways, either by face-to-face -face or through an online, uh, through telephone con uh, consultation. Each patient had a panel pharmacogenomics test, 12 genes tested, 44 variants, which covered 39 drugs that we use uh, in the British National Formulary. Each patient who was uh, in the test arm was given a pharmacogenomics card with a QR code. You could scan the QR code, which then uh, led you to online, uh, told you what the result was and what the guidance was with regard to the pharmacogenomic variant that you carry in your genome. And the primary endpoint was a reduction in ADRs. Um, and we uh, excluded people with grade one uh, ADRs, uh, grade two to five uh, ADRs were included. Uh, for certain drugs, there was some variation, which was pre-specified. Uh, we also undertook causality assessment on everybody who was found to have an ADR, and we used the Liverpool causality assessment tool, and this was developed in Liverpool and validated in Liverpool, and we were able to categorize individuals as definite, probable, and possible based on uh, the ADR. And this is the recruitment in that trial. We, we wanted to recruit 8,000 people. In the end, we managed to recruit 6,944. The first block, time block, was 3,581. Uh, we were going quite well, and we were going to achieve our targets. Unfortunately, COVID happened. And you can see, as soon as COVID happened, uh, this sort of recruitment tailed off, 
and we then had to stop the trial at 3,363 because it was not possible to continue uh, because of COVID. Since then, uh, there's been data cleansing, severity assessment. Uh, we also then genotyped the controls retrospectively so we could undertake the analysis. I'll tell you about the analysis in a minute, um, as well as undertaking uh, independent assessment of the ADRs as well through LAREB, which is um, the pharmacovigilance uh, organization in the Netherlands, which undertakes, um, looks at their spontaneous ADR reports. So this is um, the way uh, patients were randomized uh, in the control arm 3,600, in the study arm 3,300, uh, largely because of the problem that we had with COVID. Uh, it's not exactly the same number. And what we found when we looked at uh, the sort of uh, individuals in terms of the frequency of the actionable genetic variants, it was about 22% of individuals had actionable genetic variants. Now, if you look at the literature, this accords with the, uh, the literature in, in, uh, with regard to these particular drugs. And the genes that were particularly actionable are shown on the list here, cytochrome P452D6, cytochrome P452B6, etc., um, where uh, shows you the frequency of the uh, actionable variants we identified in these particular genes, again, according with the literature. Now, the drugs that were uh, relevant uh, in terms of actionability, again, shown in the slide, I won't go through the, every particular drug, atovastatin was the commonest, but some of the drugs uh, are pretty um, uh, obvious, such as antidepressants and so on, uh, particularly with regard to cytochrome P452D6. So, this is, um, I'm going to show you one uh, result slide, um, and, and this shows you uh, what, how we analyze this. So if you look at the control group, first of all, uh, you know, you can divide them into actionable or non-actionable in terms of whether they have a pharmacogenomic variant. And obviously for the control group, everybody has standard of care, i.e. Uh, there was no change in dose or choice of drug. And in that particular in in cases, we identified that 27.6% had some kind of uh, adverse drug reaction. When you look at the study arm, um, the uh, total number of actionable uh, individuals with actionable genomic variants was 718. Um, and when you then provided the pharmacogenomic information, in about 65% of cases, the pharmacogenomic information was taken into account. It's, as I said, it wasn't mandatory. Uh, the clinicians would decide themselves. But they took that information into account and they changed the dose or the, uh, or the choice of drug. And when you then look at the ADRs in that individual group, uh, it was down to 21%. There's a 30% reduction. So highlights that uh, pharmacogenomic panel was, did show utility in terms of reducing adverse drug reactions. So I think the ubiquitous pharmacogenomics consortium and the PREPARE trial is the first study to show the clinical utility associated with the pharmacogenomics panel. And this important thing was this was undertaken in different EU healthcare settings, in seven different settings, um, and uh, which, which are completely different uh, uh, healthcare organizations in those uh, different, seven different countries. There was a 30% lower risk of clinical relevant ADRs, and we developed an end-to-end -end approach with enabling tools, uh, education, training, hands-on approach to healthcare professionals, and clearly that uh, the lessons learned from that in terms of implementation will be really important because you need those end-to-end -end tools. There, in terms of implementation, we don't have to worry about genotyping now because the technologies are there. We have a lot of information, but actually more, uh, more difficult is actually what happens with the hospital system, the infrastructure, the decision support systems, etc., and how it's stored in electronic health records, which is going to be the key challenge that we face. Now, good news is that there are still more studies ongoing, and uh, this is study uh, from Sandosh Padmanaban, and he's given me this slide, and uh, I, I said I would advertise this study. It's just about to start uh, in Scotland. It's called Prophecy, and basically Sandosh is going to look at secondary care individuals, about 4,000, and primary care individuals, 5,000 in secondary care individuals. You can see that he's going to have two groups, one where there's intervention, and then a second one, uh, which is standard of care, but in the primary care setting is step wedge design, where it's going to actually undertake genotyping in different individuals at different times as per the step wedge design. And uh, Sandosh is going to have an expert panel as part of assessing 
those individual patients, and he wants to have uh, those individuals on the expert panel. So really what he really would like is clinical pharmacologists in the audience here to be able to really contact him and take part on those expert panels so you can actually assess whether the outcomes occurring in patients are related to the pharmacogenomic variants. So it's really very much uh, uh, an important study which is going on in Scotland, which may actually lead to um, f uh, implementation, further evidence on implementation. So uh, let me finish off. Now, I hope this is the future of prescribing. I don't know when it will occur. Uh, it may occur, it will probably occur well after I've retired and many of you have retired, but hopefully younger people uh, in the audience can take this forward. And I hope that in the future, that when we are prescribing on the wards, we can use the information technology we have. We'll have data on all those variables that you see on screen. Um, the sort of computer systems will be powerful enough to have the electronic health records, the pharmacometric models and artificial intelligence, which will be able to allow us to be able to have the precision dosing and precision choice for better patient outcomes. Clearly, this is something that the pharmacological community in the audience will be really important in driving forward, I think. Um, but we will also need the help from the NHS for other infrastructure changes which need to occur. The digital transformation which has been promised, which is so slow, there are at least 30% of hospitals in this country which don't have an electronic health record at the moment. We will need intelligent decision support systems, uh, which are going to be really important. And we're holding a workshop very uh, so uh, soon on decision support systems and how we can actually improve those decision support systems for future implementation into the NHS. As we move forward, I really think that um, there will be convergence in medicines and devices uh, because we'll be using these decision support systems which are categorized and medical devices at the moment. And as I said earlier, that we will need to make sure that we have the processes in place using the uh, digital infrastructure that we have to have continual assessment utility like learning health systems so that we can continuously improve what we do in terms of uh, our patients and try to look at the variability in terms of medicines and try to improve uh, what we can do with our patients to make sure that we don't just use one dose fits all, one drug fits all strategy. And inclusivity is going to be important for those um, uh, examples I gave earlier. We do not include enough women in trials. We do not include enough elderly people in trial. We do not include enough uh, overweight individuals in trials. And we need to make sure that we do that uh, in terms of improving the way we use medicine, the way we develop medicines, and the way we practice medicine. So I want to th finish off by thanking all the people who have been involved in the work I undertake, um, and uh, the UPGX consortium as well, which was funded uh, by the EU uh, to 15 million euros, and had over 150 people worked on this, including many people uh, in the audience who work with me in Liverpool. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Munir. That was tremendous. Um, so we're going to bring the lights up, and then there are four microphones. Uh, two um, in the middle and two right at the back for you to come to the microphone. It's tr quite tricky for me to see, so give me a wave, uh, especially when we get to the back of the hall. Uh, but you ha now have open season on this man. Uh, by the way, did you notice he gave you all a job? You've only been here for 45 minutes and he's given you a job to do, but it's an important job. And if we get this right, we'll change medicine safeties forever. forever. So while you're thinking, I'm just going to put one question to Munir. So, Munir, you've given us a sort of framework for how, in personalized prescribing, this might be done. Let's, no, I don't want to get into the weeds particularly, but how are we actually going to do it? So, have you, you've obviously been given some thought. Uh, obviously, there would be regional clinical pharmacologists supporting this, but what about the role of pharmacy? Um, we can't just drop yet another decision support system from a great height onto general practice. I mean, if you ever look at EMIS, they've got flags coming up all the time yes. telling them to do stuff. Yeah. It's their worst nightmare. Yeah. No, and, and th th that is correct. The first thing to say is that uh, we need to work in collaboration and partnership with pharmacy. Uh, you know, to be, and it's got to be a multidisciplinary team approach. Uh, and particularly for complex patients, you will need care of the elderly physicians. You will need uh, other uh, specialties involved in terms of make sure that we are doing the right thing. But I think clinical pharmacology can show leadership here, yeah. really, to be able to lead these kind of 
uh, processes within the NHS as implementation comes forward. Decision support is going to be very important, but obviously the decision support systems that are available at the moment tend to put up a lot of flags, you know, so for, and, and everybody yeah. just switches them off before, because of alert fatigue. So we need to think about how we develop decision support systems, hence the workshop that we're holding in Liverpool in, on November the 9th, really to understand what is needed from the user's perspective so that we make sure that we can develop intelligent decision support systems which are not, um, which don't have the disadvantages of current decision support systems. We are also undertaking at the moment a pilot in the Northwest um, and the pilot in the Northwest at the moment, which is being led by the Genomics Laboratory Hub uh, uh, in, in uh, the Northwest, um, is really not to, um, is not to get statistically significant results on a particular pharmacogenomic variant, as we have done with the UPGX trial, but really is to understand the processes, yeah. to understand the pathways. Where are the major hurdles in terms of pathways implementation? I think the major hurdles are going to be initially in deciding when you actually have the test done, yeah. because you need that uh, uh, knowledge, but also in how you then integrate that into the electronic health care record. The in-between aspects, actually where you do the genetic testing, is actually easy now. Yeah, yeah. That's the easy part. The it's the other part is much more difficult. Yeah, that's not the barrier anymore. You're absolutely right. I liked your idea of preemptive banking of uh, testing. We go to microphone number four. Please say who you are and ask your question. Hi there. Stuart Jones from King's College London. Brilliant talk. Thanks so much. Um, you spent a lot of time talking about uh, implementation in the NHS and you talked about preemptive uh, information. What about during uh, medicines development in those early stages, phase one, phase two, medicines development? What is the role of pharmacogenomics there? And is there something the pharmaceutical industry do, can do to build up information earlier so that when it comes through to patients, then that you've got more information to use? Yeah, great, great question. Thank you very much. So I think, I think there are two aspects to that. The first one is the conventional way of pharmacogenomics that I mentioned there. Um, we know that there is often very good knowledge of pharmacogenomic variation early on during drug development. And often there may be something in the uh, SPC um, and basically, it, it just says that this, uh, there may be a polymorphism which may affect it, but largely says ignore it at the moment. Uh, and, and we need to think about how we can actually improve that uh, information, the SPC. Um, often, uh, I think that in the future, phase one studies may need to be stratified according to the genotype if you have enough evidence from preclinical studies showing that, for example, if a drug's metabolized by 2D6, then it's important to undertake studies uh, in not only in 2D6 extensive metabolizers, but in 2D6 poor metabolizers to understand the degree of variation you get. And, and those kind of precision early phase studies are going to be important as well. Uh, I know that pharmaceutical industry does that for certain drugs, and there are some drugs such as Eliglustat, which have uh, information in their uh, label which says genotype for 2D6 before you give Eliglustat and give a lower dose in those people who are poor metabolizers. But a bigger area actually for industry is using pharmacogenomics information for develop for drug discovery and drug development. And drug discovery uh, is particularly where you can actually use genomic targets to uh, then uh, define whether you can actually develop a drug based on that genomic target. And studies have already shown that if you have a drug which is based on a genomic target, your success rate is at least twofold higher. And this is data from GSK plus very many other uh, companies which has actually shown that. But also, um, we can actually use genomics information in terms of safety assessment as well. Um, because if you have somebody who has a particular genetic mutation, a rare disease, which causes a particular um, adverse phenotype, then it's important that you don't use that drug as a target for your drug development or you make sure that your off-target assessment uh, doesn't actually affect that particular drug target which may lead to the severe ADR. So there are many different ways I think the industry is going to use pharmacogenomics information in the future. Microphone two. Um, thank you very much, Muni, for this fantastic talk. I'm Ingolf Kaskorbi, University of Kiel in Germany. Uh, Great to see how NHS supports all the pharmacogenetic services now. Now here in Germany or in other EU countries, uh, the regulatory authorities are maybe more reluctant to, to uh, support or 
information. There is some information, but so far I think it's only related to really life-threatening events. So with HLH, HLA markers, for instance, now DPYD was introduced, and once it was introduced, also the payers opened their bursaries, and now it was immediately introduced into clinical practice. As well, UGT101 is now um, implemented or reimbursed in Germany since three weeks. Now, it's all related to drugs which may cause severe adverse events. Looking now for psychotropic drugs or antidepressants, or so, I think it's more moderate uh, adverse events. Now, how to convince the regulatory authorities and payers also to support such services? Yeah, um, and, and that's an important point. I guess the point I also want to make from the UPGX is that although some of them were kind of mild adverse drug reactions, you know, grade two, two, three, uh, et cetera, um, those are important for the patient's lives, actually because they affect quality of life. Uh, and somebody who st has mild adverse drug reaction is going to stop taking the drug um, and therefore have non-adherence and therefore have worse outcomes. So I think we need to take into account the effects that occur on a population level as well. You know, obviously when you're actually looking at individuals with the rare adverse events, the serious ones that may lead to hospitalization, then what you find is that people say, well, actually, that's not really public health. But actually, when you're looking at the totality of adverse drug reactions, from mild to serious, then that's a huge issue that we have in our population in terms of the way we use medicines. Um, and that is a public health issue. And really, I think the regulatory agencies, the uh, national health authorities, really need to look at um, the medicines landscape in terms of the public health issues that we're creating. Clearly, we are benefiting patients, but we're also harming some patients. And when you look at the totality of numbers of people we harm, that is a public health issue. And I think although pharmacogenomics people think, actually, this is personalized medicine, actually, it is also precision public health as well in terms of trying to implement that. It's okay. Number one. Um, hello, um, Anne Daly, Newcastle University. Thank you, Munir, for an excellent talk. There's one point I slightly disagree with you on. It. You've said that doing the test is all sorted out and easy now. Now, if you know what polymorphism you want to test for, I would agree with that. But the issue is that we've got increasingly multi-ethnic uh, populations in this country and elsewhere. And it is not as simple as knowing which SNP you should test for. I think we need to get the, the system running, but we need to understand more about things like rare variants and their effect in pharmacogenomics as well. And we need to make decisions about how much genetic information is needed in terms of guiding prescribing. That's probably less clear, I think, at the moment. The systems are good, but the knowledge, I think, is still incomplete. So, uh, and yes, I agree with you, and, and I made it, um, I simplified it largely because of the time I had, um, and uh, uh, you know, you're quite right, there are many different things which are coming through, and that's why I said, we said in our report that this has to be iterative, it needs to start somewhere with the knowledge that we have, and then needs to advance and include other things which come through, which will be rare variants, the ethnicity-specific ethnicity variants, and the polygenic risk scores which are coming in, as well as epigenetic phenomena which are coming in. And so but you have to start somewhere and advance. If you, if you wait for the absolute perfect scenario, you're never going to be able to implement this. So you do have to start somewhere. But, but, there, but more research needs to be undertaken. That was one of our main recommendations, which actually takes into account some of those things. And the ethnicity aspects are very important. Um, diversity is not uh, prevalent in the genomics field. As I said, 97% of all uh, GWASs which have been done have been in European ancestry population. Only 0.4 uh, to 0.7% have been done in African or African-American populations. And a typical example of that is DPD testing, dihydropyrimidine dehydrogenase testing for 5-FU. This was introduced in October 2020 in the, U, uh, in the whole of the UK. 40,000 tests are being done by genomics laboratory hubs at the moment, and we test for four variants. But all those variants are European ancestry variants. So somebody who comes in who's an African ancestry, who then has that test done, will inevitably be wild type. 
um, because we won't be testing for the African specific variants at the moment. So we're actually undertaking some work which has been funded by the Race Health Observatory, undertaking a building of massive consortium throughout the world of people of different ethnicities sequencing the DPD gene to identify the sort of ethnic specific variants. We can then actually uh, put a case forward to the NHS genetic test directory to actually expand beyond the four variants we're testing for. So that kind of work needs to be going on in the background, but we do need to start implementing at some point. And this, I think, as, according, as, as we said in our report, is the right time. So a potential way of addressing that, Munir, is, is using the National Genomic Medicine Service and the test directory, as you suggest, because um, increasing numbers of patients will get extensive genomic testing, but also we can use that to bring live appropriate NGS panels for PGX. Um, and one of the things I did when we were establishing that was to get them to do an annual review. So what's your sense of how close are we to getting uh, proper PGX testing, at, at least in response mode, but also if you can send them in response mode, you can bank that data and accrue longitudinal life course electronic health data and then use that to do what Anne wants to do, which is to look at rare variants or indeed other variants that are not single nucleotide variants, copy yeah. number, whatever it is. So, so I, I, I think that uh, um, the study that the pilot that's going on in the Northwest and the sort of study that Sandosh is doing are all going to add to the uh, evidence base. Uh, there are other things which are coming through, such as you know, sorting out the decision support systems. So if I was to say how, how soon will we have some kind of pharmacogenomics implementation on a large number of variants, I would say in the next two to three years. That's very good, very good. And what do we need to do to integrate the pharmacists and clinical pharmacologists to get the network you want? So uh, really working with the pharmacists. Again, the pharmacists, as with uh, medics, there's a huge knowledge cap. Yeah. And that, that's important to be able to, uh, and you know, so I interact with pharmacists all the time. I'm giving a talk at their uh, conference, national conference, the Royal Pharmaceutical Society Conference, uh, end of this year. So mm -hmm. I think that is really into, uh, you know, working with the pharmacists, you know, uh, being part of the team. Yeah. You know, obviously, I think you were talking to Andrew Webb, uh, David oh, sorry, Webb. David Webb, yeah. um, you know, in terms of the chief pharmaceutical officer. Uh, and, you know, really sort of working with the pharmacy community to be able to make sure that we are part of the same community, working in a multidisciplinary team to take this forward. And hearts and minds in general practice? Sorry? How are you going to win the hearts and minds of general practice? So, so again, the, the pilot actually that we undertake in Northwest is primary care based. Great, okay. So it has to be primary care based because we re, you know, that's where most of the prescribing occurs. Uh, ab absolutely excellent. So, ladies and gentlemen, we've kept him on the hook for nearly the best part of an hour. I think he's done a good job, hasn't he? Thank you very much, Munir, for a brilliant talk. You, you've also got the small matter of a job to take home, which he's also given you, which is to spread the word about PGX. The society could make a real difference to problems with medicines in our society and their safety if we could just do half the things this man was talking about. So, ladies and gentlemen, I should also have thought, thanked earlier Cherry Wainwright, our meeting secretary, for a fabulous program. There is a short break now, but please do enjoy the rest of the day, and uh, I hope you have a fabulous meeting together and this first time when we got together after three years' break. <laughs>